Um, good afternoon. Welcome to Dare to Know, Prints and Drawings in the Age of Enlightenment, which is presented by our friends at the Print Council of America. I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation, and I would like to say a special word of thanks to the current and most recent past presidents of the Print Council. Mary Weaver Chapin is right there, uh, Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Portland Art Museum. Ooh, Mary. And Shelley Langdale, curator and head of modern prints and drawings at the National Gallery, who I think is not here yet. Yay! Um, just a thanks for, for collaborating with us at the IFPDA and, and helping develop so much rich programming over the past few, few years for Print Month. Um, today's program embraces the range of expertise within the IFPDA and within the Print Council, taking us back to the 18th century with a discussion of the exhibition Dare to Know Prints and Drawings in the Age of Enlightenment. The exhibition, which is currently on view at the Harvard Art Museums, examines the critical role played by the graphic arts in the construction and dissemination of ideas during the Enlightenment period. The exhibition argues that prints and drawings wielded the potential to visually articulate, reinforce, or contradict beliefs as well as biases, while also arguing for social action and imagining new realities. The exhibition was curated by our presenters today, Elizabeth Rudy, who is the Carl Weihauser Curator of Prints at the Harvard Art Museums, <clears throat> and Crystal Sementek, Associate Professor of Art History at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, along with two contributors whom they'll be introducing. Uh, Elizabeth is the Carl Weihauser Curator of Prints at the Harvard Art Museums, where she stewards a collection spanning the 16th century to contemporary, her scholarly publications have focused on 18th and 19th century France with a particular focus on etching and early lithography, but her most recent exhibition featured contemporary prints from the Brandywine Workshop and Archives, which is located in Philadelphia. Crystal Smentek is an historian of 18th century European art with specializations in histories of the graphic and decorative arts, the history of collecting, and European encounters with Asia. Uh, Crystal has received fellowships and awards from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme Paris, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery, D.C., among others. So um, with that, I'm very happy to step down and turn over the mic. Thank you so much, Jenny. On behalf of the Dare to Know team, I'd like to express my gratitude to the IFPDA for giving us the chance to tell you about our project and hopefully to entice all of you to come to Cambridge to see the show. I'd also like to thank Mary Weaver Chapin, President of Print Council, and Deborah Wood, Vice President, for giving us this opportunity to introduce our project. It's been in development for several years and is indebted to numerous members of Print Council, not only our generous lenders, but our fellow scholars who shared their knowledge and connected us with experts in fields well beyond our own. Dare to Know focuses on the complicated era in European history known as the Age of Enlightenment. It was a period that spanned roughly the years 1720 to 1800 that saw profound shifts in science, philosophy, the arts, and societies at large harboring more nuanced ways of seeing the world and its inhabitants. But it was also a century of persistent oppression, a time when national economies were still fueled by colonial domination and the trafficking of enslaved in individuals. Scholars today continue to debate the definition, the duration, and the very existence of enlightenment, just as thinkers at the time did. A German journal posed the following question to its readers in 1783, what is enlightenment? The following year, the philosopher Immanuel Kant argued that his main impulse was to dare to know, to pursue knowledge for oneself without relying on others to interpret facts and experiences. In borrowing that exhortation, our exhibition interrogates the role that images, and specifically drawings and prints, played in the propagation of ideas and the construction of blind spots in the 18th century. Quicker and cheaper to produce and transport than other media, Drawings and prints were poised to satisfy the needs and shape the opinions of a rapidly growing consumer market. They made new things visible and in more concrete ways than text and speech. They could argue for social, social action and new realities in ways that were more urgent and provocative for better and worse. 
and they were tangible objects that required a physical engagement with the viewer to be picked up in bound volumes, to be unfolded, to have their flaps lifted, and more. In our three themes, unfolding over three galleries, we consider how works on paper were active agents, provoking viewers in their time to investigate, to persuade, and to imagine. The breadth and complexity of this historic period and our inquiry into it necessitated, we thought, a complicated approach. Our catalog, whose dust jacket is pictured here, informed every aspect of the exhibition. Inspired by the 18th century opus called the Encyclopedia, we adopted an A to Z format. It's comprised of 26 thematic essays with 10 focused smaller essays, which we have called spotlights. A grand total of 24 scholars contributed to this book, and an even larger community of experts provided critical input and guidance for our collective work. We've brought the catalog into the exhibition explicitly on the labels. Many of them, such as the ones I'm showing here, include references to the essays and spotlights through the symbol of an open eye, followed by the one word title of the text. Our goal in this approach is to highlight and acknowledge the continuous, ever ongoing nature of intellectual inquiry. There's always another perspective to consider, a new context to examine, another way of seeing a work of art. So my colleagues prepared a marvelous short film to advertise our book, which Michelle is very kindly going to cue up here. It's only one minute, 30 seconds, but it does capture the spirit of our book. The first work of art visitors and readers encounter for our project is the Four Color Mezzo Tint by Jacques Fabien Gauthier d'Agoti. This print is one of the most well known works of art from the century and appears on all of our promotional materials and banners. The print shows the muscles of the back at life size scale and based on drawings made from the study of a dissected body of a young girl. In its original context, shown here, the print illustrated a medical treatise about the structure, arrangement, and action of the muscles. All the plates are life-size and were intended to be coated in varnish to look like paintings. Like many of us, the Surrealists were troubled by this print and its conflation of eroticism and macabre voyeurism with purported science and more. In the early 20th century, it earned the moniker the anatomical angel, which is how many of us still know it today. As we've talked and thought about what makes this print uncomfortable and cringeworthy for our modern eyes, it became increasingly clear to us on the project that this was exactly the kind of thing that we were finding in other works throughout the show. As we would study and learn more about a particular drawing or print, its layers and complexities would often lead us to strange and haunting places. And for this reason, we thought this print was apt for alerting visitors to our particular interrogation of this era. The text that accompanies this print in the medical treatise explicitly refers to the presence of the figure's head, explaining that it was included in the composition to improve the overall appearance of the body, to lend it a beauty or charm. In this, I find a tacit acknowledgement of the manipulation of the figure's anatomy and perhaps an attempt to mitigate its horror. The text goes on to stipulate that the figure is looking back over her right shoulder. 
By thus pinpointing her gaze, the author tries to broker a connection between the figure and us, the viewer, but at the same time suggests that a live dissection is on display before our very eyes. As I've discussed this composition and this print with visitors thus far in the run of the exhibition, it's become clear that the difficulty that we have with this print today has a lot to do with the various ruptures across the page, the places where art and science almost work at cross purposes, out of sync with each other, rather than har being harmonious. We've thought about this kind of asynchronicity in other works as well, and it informed our selection of objects. Our choice of which impression of the famous chimera, for instance, was never going to be one of the prized early states, but the final state, shown here, with Ponceron's lengthy inscription, the story this publisher invented to place it in a context um, in which this beast would become something neoclassical, something other. We also included works that speak to cultural exchange at the time, the fusion of technologies, artistic traditions. Um, this pair of, of engravings by Ilanti, a Manchu artist, represents two of the palaces built in a European style by Chinese artists on the Imperial Gardens in, Be in Beijing. Our exhibition also includes many fun design elements. In this, we hope to highlight the relevance of the 18th century to today and to remind visitors how dynamic and, and engaging works of paper really are. We also included, thanks to our generous lenders, some spectacular works of art. This is a transparency drawing by the artist Carmontel, lent to us by the Getty Museum. And we also included many works that warrant greater scrutiny and thought still. This glorious drawing was generously lent by the Morgan Library and Museum, whose attribution and sitter are still being puzzled over and debated by specialists. We hope you'll come to Cambridge and join the conversation to explore the show with us and contribute your own expertise to our collective understanding of this period and its art. I'm joined today by my co-curator, Crystal Smentek, and two of the contributors to our show and book, who will all give you a fuller introduction to the to the original scholarship that undergirds our project. Together, they'll provide a slice of the conversations, debates, and discoveries that typified our work, and they will share research that's published in these essays, Wager, Knowledge, and Geography. And now I'd like to welcome Thea Goldring to take us into the theme of Wager. Thea is writing a dissertation examining how French materialism transformed the subjects and conditions of artistic practice in the second half of the 18th century. Her recent publications, which are many, <laughs> include an article on the South Sea Bubble prints in the journal 18th Century Studies, a forthcoming essay on Le Prince's prints in Print Quarterly, and the January issue of Master Drawings will feature her discovery of 50 drawings by Carême de Fécamp. Please join me in welcoming Thea to the podium. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Crystal, not only for inviting us to participate today, but allowing us to be part of what is a thoughtful and insightful and truly exciting exhibit, so thank you. Like the illusionistic sheets of the Bubbler's Medley, or a sketch of the times being Europe's memorial for the year 1720, published by the London printmaker and print seller Thomas Bowles, the 18th century economy was a wash in paper bills of exchange, stock shares, bank bills. As I discuss in my catalog essay and as, ex as explored in this exhibition, throughout the century, prints and drawings, themselves paper objects, were employed to explore these new forms of value and confront anxieties about their contingency. Today, in addition to presenting these paper products, I would like to share some recent thoughts on the visual language these prints established, which long outlasted the original economic crisis. So in 1720, the implosion of John Law's Mississippi Company in France and the British South Sea Company, which were both joint stock ventures whose share prices rose on a wave of speculation before collapsing, swept across Europe. In March of 1721, Bowles published a series of prints related to these financial calamities known respectively as the Mississippi and South Sea Bubbles. 
Some of them repurposed works from a collection of Dutch prints entitled The Great Mirror of Folly, which satirized the bubbles. And several sheets from this compendium are now on view at the New York Public Library in a wonderful exhibit entitled Fortune and Folly in 1720, which I highly encourage everyone to go see. Others, such as the pair of bubblers medleys developed new imagery, and the one on the right is featured in the show. The South Sea bubble was a cycle of speculation driven by various new forms of credit and the stock shares novelty. While nominally the South Sea Company, or SSC, held a monopoly on the sale of African slaves to, the, to Spain's American colonies, its real business began in 1718 when the South Sea Company was given the right to purchase privately held government debt from individuals using stock shares. The higher the shares trading price, the fewer shares the company had to give to individuals for their government annuities, and the more it could sell for a profit on the open market. To this end, the directors inflated the price by demanding less and less money down for shares listed at higher and higher valuations, allowing buyers to purchase stock on credit, and even lending the, money, the company's money directly to investors. Speculators bought and sold paper shares whose nominal worth was supposedly backed by government debt, but whose market value was propped up by numerous layers of credit. As I have argued elsewhere, Bowles's medley prints invite viewers to replay the act of speculating, to wager on their ability to make sense of the paper instruments swirling around the South Sea. The Latin motto beneath the two titles, which translates to if the people wish to be deceived, let them be deceived, could apply either to the prince or investment in the propped up South Sea stock. Just as it is possible to see through the prince illusion, so too could astute investors ride the wave of the South Sea bubble and make off handsomely. And one medley, see here, includes a fictional act of successful speculation. So you can see that in the upper right is a receipt dated to May 19th, 1720, which records that Simon Nowit, Esquire, purchased from Thomas Foresight a 100 pounds South Sea Company share for 10 times that amount. As the seller's name suggests, Foresight sold the stock at a hefty profit before the market collapsed in August. Nowit, also aptly named, on the other hand, did not see through the layers of, the, of paper inflating the bubble. In a few months, his investment would be worthless. Nowit was in economic parlance the greater fool, the late investor that allows astute sellers to get out at a profit. As Nowit's misguided purchase illustrates, timing was critical in the new financial markets. It is thus perhaps curious that the bubblers' medleys continued to appeal to consumers beyond their original moment in time. Most of the impressions of these prints, including the one in the exhibit, date from the later reissue by Carrington Bowles. Carrington joined his Uncle Thomas's shop in Paul's churchyard around 1766 and advertised this pair of prints in 1784, so they were reissued uh, sometime in the interim. Their lives do not end there, however. The impression originally selected for exhibition from the Baker Library at Harvard Business School, while listed as a 19th century print, was discovered to have a watermark which dated it to the early 19th century. Similarly, an impression of the other medley currently on view at the New York Public Library is also dates to 1823. Now, one might ascribe these prints continued appeal to their graphic illusion. However, details included in them, such as the copy of the London Gazette announcing, to there, announcing them, announcing uh, the Bubblers Act on 1816, which precipitated the crash, suggests that the particulars and the imagery of the 1720 crisis stuck in the public's mind long after the original generation of investors and losers had passed. The drawing that accompanies the Bubblers medley in Dare to Know sheds some light on the medley's reappearance later in the century. So this large-scale calligraphic drawing, which dates the 1780s, entitled The Money Devil, remains tantalizingly enigmatic. The intended purpose, as well as identity, of the various characters in the central scene and border vignettes remain fertile ground for future research. The author of this drawing, Roger Laurent, likely a pseudonym, remains largely a mystery. 
However, the honorarium uh, at the top, which is maître écrivain or master scrivener, indicates that the artist was associated with the Bureau Académique d'Écriture. In the 18th century, this French corporation taught courses in penmanship and financial accounting, and most importantly, held a monopoly on the verification of a handwriting in legal proceedings. As more forms of commercial paper began circulating in France, the Bureau became increasingly critical to the economy as both a producer of financial documents and arbiter of authenticity and thus value. As a Scrivener, the drawing's author had intimate knowledge of financial developments in France in the 1780s. So in 1776, the Caisse des Comptes, the first central bank since John Law's financial system had collapsed in 1720s, was established and then soon stumbled. In the 1780s, both its bank bills and its shock stock shares plummeted in value. Faced with the rise and fall of a new bank, the money devil revives imagery from the 1720s. So much of the visual language came again from the Dutch print collection, The Great Mirror of Folly. While the connection hasn't been previously made, the calligraphic form of the drawing also finds a counterpart in this anonymous pair that was added to some versions of the Dutch compendium. However, the money devil transforms these models. The central figure sporting a wig recalls earlier depictions of John Law. Yet while John Law and the money devil were formally presented as accomplices, here, Law stands upon him like a grotesque version of the archangel Michael. The resurrection of the central banking system may well have seemed like Law's triumph 60 years later. In short, in the 1780s, the international graphic imagery of the 1720s provided a recognizable visual language with which to address the resurgence of paper financial instruments and to articulate anew concerns about new forms of banking and value. The language generated by the 1720s financial bubbles established not only models that could be used for later crises, but also the terms of engagement by which this economic activity continued to be understood generally. So for example, here's in the first scene of Cruikshank's print, The Progress of Disappointment or The Hopes of the Day, published in 1815, um, which it makes several references to the earlier bubbles in its presentation of a jock stoink, jock joint stock company, which is the first scene there I've enlarged, uh, dividing its losses. And these include a book on the table entitled History of the South Sea Company, among others. A bubble-blowing poodle, similar to that seen in the lower right corner of one of the bubbler's medleys, also appears in the background on the wall. He is sitting on a pedestal composed of 500 shares upheld by, quote, waste paper. <laughs> Elsewhere, I have written about how the prince responding to the 1720 crash helped engender the modern notion of a bubble as a speculative opportunity that will eventually burst, rewarding astute investors, but leaving stragglers with nothing but air. The repetition of this imagery articulates underlying our assumptions about investing. It accepts risk and empty value as a premise. These images shaped not only the terms of engagement of the new financial markets, but also the terms in which we continue to describe that history. So the Bubbler's Medleys contain numerous references to the bubble cards, a set of playing cards with satirical vignettes about the bubbles also published by Bulls. And here you can see uh, a selection appears in the exhibit. The bubble card showing investors jumping from a tree reproduced in one of the medleys can be identified as part of the original packaging. I suggest that the stock jobbing cards vignette in the second medley was the, likely the other side of the packet. Once again, stock jobbing and bubbles uh, form two sides of the same coin. Now, the British Museum contains a 19th century reproduction of the stock jobbing card, so the other side of the packet, which it identifies as a press clipping. The card was in fact cut from the publication, Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay, written and published, sorry, in 1841. As the title indicates, this foundational text in the history of bubbles describes the 1720s as a gambling mania. Echoing McKay's 19th century description, contemporary accounts of the South Sea bubble still refer to investors' crowd mentality, mass delusion, and illogical frenzy. McKay suggests the card satire was intended to appeal to, quote, 
the sane portion of the public who was not engaged in speculation. When McKay reproduced the cards, as the footnote describes, he cut them out of the medleys. And in fact, his reading depends on removing the cards from their original context in both the trompe l'oeil compositions and the 1720s print market. The medleys and associated prints published by Bowles emphasize that there were both winners and losers in the financial crisis. Excerpted, the cards become symbols of reckless gambling, when in fact they were part of a complex network of visual signs that articulated a new relationship between meaning, value, and time on which certain parties did capitalize. Taken alone, the cards satirize a logical frenzy. Taken as part of a broader visual language, they speak to the emergence of a system that was knowingly predicated on the existence of a greater fool. And current discussions of the earlier bubbles should carefully parse the visual language established by the 1720s prints. Between when I wrote my catalog essay and the show's opening, I watched History of Pete itself in the GameStop short squeeze in 1720, 2021. Sorry. In this highly publicized episode, an internet community of individual investors bought GameStop stock and encouraged others to do the same as a means um, of being able to profit from a vulnerable position held by a few hedge funds. The parallels between the 1720s bubbles and the GameStop saga are striking. Both involve new ways of engaging with the stock market, complex financial instruments which were not understood by all parties, and participation of a new types of investors. In both cases, an immense amount of money was made by those who convinced others to invest so as to keep the price up while they cashed out. Popular accounts which associated the GameStop squeeze with prior bubbles, including the South Sea, reiterated the notion of a speculative frenzy. It was McKay's bubble cards and reckless gambling all over again. But as the bubblers medleys can continue to remind us, in a world of fictional value, making a profit requires not only seeing through the illusion first, but also getting someone else to buy the illusion, which in a different sense, is exactly what Bowles did. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, this show has been long in the making, so it's a real pleasure to be able to share it with the public, but also to um, share it with you. So I'm gonna start with this. Um, so the print you see here, Tableau of the Principal Religions of the World, first produced in 1727 and on view in our exhibition, is representative of a genre of imagery that may not immediately come to mind when thinking of the European Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is often understood as secular in orientation, and yet faith continued to structure life and thought for all but a few committed atheists. Prince of the time reaffirmed the righteousness of Christianity, but they also became a vehicle for questioning it, and crucially, for the investigation of religion itself. Prints and drawings interpreted the influx of information about the world's belief systems communicated by colonists, merchants, and missionaries. They brought the diversity of the world powerfully into view, simultaneously registering acceptance of difference and lingering ambivalence about it. So the engraving on the screen was produced by the printmaker Bernard Picard for the most celebrated 18th century European publication on the topic of religion, the seven volume Religious Ceremonies and Customs of All the Peoples of the World, first published from 1723 to 1737 and widely translated, reprinted and adapted thereafter. And in this remarkable folio-sized print, Picard has set aside the then standard division between Christians and the so-called infidels of the rest of the world. Instead, we see all known world religions included in the same plate. Islam is represented in the foreground, Judaism and various Christian denominations occupy the middle ground, and seen in the distance are the temples and gods of Asia and the Americas. Though they are hierarchically ordered, all of the belief systems then known to Europeans are represented. In its inclusiveness, the print echoes the sweeping ambition of the book in which it appeared. 
The engraving was designed as the frontispiece for the book four years after the printing of the first edition began, and demand for the book was assured. Its spectacular success was largely due to its images, the majority of which were by Picard, a celebrated printmaker at the time. Inside the book, some 600 illustrations distributed over more than 250 plates depicted the marriage and funerary rituals, the processions, and the styles of worship of contemporary Judaism, Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy, Protestantism, and Islam, and of peoples in the Americas, India, Asia, and Africa. And the illustrations made these practices visible with an immediacy that pub the publication's hundreds of pages of text could not. Because prints not only visualized the plurality of the world's belief systems, they put them on equal footing with Christianity. They allowed a public clearly curious about the differing religious practices of the globe, the opportunity to witness and compare these customs for themselves, and in so doing, recognize not only the differences, but also the commonalities among the world's diverse peoples. And these goals are condensed in the frontispiece, which like the publication itself, exemplifies a significant legacy of the Enlightenment. The discovery of religions in the plural and the understanding of religious rituals as social or cultural phenomena common to all humans. Now, that said, the more tolerant understanding of religious difference, which both the frontispiece and the book itself promotes, is not neutral. Picard and his collaborator on the ceremony and customs, Jean-Frédéric Bernard, were both Protestants, and their antipathy to Catholicism is evident in the opening print. In the middle register at left, we see Protestant reformers who despite their doctrinal differences are peace peacefully grouped around the woman in white holding a Bible. In the same register at right, however, an allegory of the Roman Catholic Church accompanied by a personification of superstition is surrounded by fractious representatives of various Catholic orders and the personification of the Catholic Church tramples on the Jewish rabbi at her feet there are clearly limits to the acceptance of confessional variety. A far less well-known print in the media landscape of the 18th century is this German broadside also on view in our exhibition. Produced in the early 1740s, this single sheet print with a letterpress text represents the first Indian Lutheran minister, Pastor Aaron, ordained in 1733 at a pietist mission in Danish-controlled Trankabar on the Bay of Bengal. An openness to the religious customs of other peoples did not lessen the ambition to convert others to one's own faith. And this broadside was one of a sequence of similar images of Aaron that publicized the unprecedented news of the ordination of a Tamil pastor and by implication, the success of the powerful religious reform movement of pietism and its young mission in India. The many prints made of Aaron show him dressed in local clothing rather than the dark robes of European missionaries. And all were ultimately based on this Indian portrait on paper sent from Trankabar to Germany at the request of pietist leaders. The Indian likeness allowed church authorities to see Pastor Aaron for themselves, even though he was thousands of miles away. But as you can also see, for the print, which was intended to circulate widely among a broad public, the Indian portrait was modified to suit European conventions of representation. And the exotic appeal of Aaron's likeness was amplified through the addition of cacti and palm trees. The proliferating prints of Aaron raised significant funds for the Trankabar mission and made Pastor Aaron an international celebrity. At the same time, the prints register ambivalence about the wider world. Interest in costume, disinterest in alternative aesthetic conventions, and, and the rejection of other religious faiths. For the print is, after all, a celebration of conversion. Other engravings, such as this interactive flap print made in 1755, also on view in the exhibition, sought to heighten the viewer's encounter with unfamiliar religious customs by inviting the viewer's physical manipulation. 
in a flat print like this one by the Zurich engraver Johann Rudolf Holzhalp, a second engraved paper was affixed to the main print. Um, when the flap is closed, one sees the doors to the tombs of the biblical Jews. When one leans in and lifts the flap, the bodies inside are suddenly revealed. And the anticipation uh, elicited by the flap is followed by the frisson of visually, even illicitly, entering a tomb and seeing the shrouded Jewish dead inside. We know very little about why this print was made in 1755, but circum circumstantial evidence suggests it may obliquely reference the practices of contemporary Jews, a persecuted religious minority within 18th century Europe. Holzhalp's print may allude to the very recent decision made by Swiss, Swiss authorities in 1750 to allow Jews in the only two municipalities in which they were permitted to reside to bury their dead on Swiss soil rather than travel to Germany as they had previously been required to do. The first burials in the new Gem Jewish cemetery occurred in 1752. But here too, acceptance, if that is indeed the goal of this print, is apparently tempered by the desire to convert. A caption at the bottom of the print from the Book of Revelation may allude to the belief among some Christians that the Book of Revelation predicated the widespread conversion of Jews to Christianity at the end of times. And the caption um, is from Revelations, as I said, and reads, blessed are those who die in the Lord, they rest from their labors. So the images I've shown here are a fraction of the prints on the topic of religion circulating in the Age of Enlightenment. They reaffirmed Christian belief, but also brought unfamiliar peoples and their belief systems into view, potentially prompting questions about one's faith, but and cumulatively presenting religious rituals as phenomena common to all peoples. Collectively, these works on paper brought the world to 18th century Europe's armchair travelers, for some, they undoubtedly confirmed prejudices, but they must also have helped to persuade some viewers to begin to set aside religious dogmatism and accept confessional variety. And though only partially and imperfectly realized in practice, by the end of the 18th century, religious tolerance was an ideal by which the Enlightenment represented itself to itself, as you see in this almanac print by Daniel Chorowiecki, um, published in 1792. And in this self-congratulatory work, enlightened wisdom in the form of Minerva, the Roman goddess of wisdom, takes all of the religions of the world under her protection. And at her feet, according to the accompanying caption, are Turks, Jews, Catholics, Lutherans, Calvinists, Quakers, Mennonites, Moravians, and at the very far left, the Chinese. Thank you. So one of the great pleasures of working on this show was collaborating and learning from many colleagues. So I'm very pleased to um, introduce one of these collaborators, um, Kabel An, who will address the theme of geography. Cabell is in the final year of her PhD at Harvard, where she is completing a dissertation on a data-driven approach to drawing exhibitions in 18th century Italy and France. She has published articles and many articles and contributed to edited volumes on subjects ranging from the drawing gallery installed in the Louvre in 1797, the visual culture of New France, collectors of 17th century Dutch art in Paris, and techno-nostalgia and archaeological praxis in contemporary art. Please join me in welcoming Cabell. Let's see if I can lower this. There we go. All right, thank you, Crystal, for the intro. Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here. What is the role of geography in the Enlightenment? Or what is the geography of the Enlightenment as a movement? Today I'll be discussing how drawings and prints participated in geographical thinking by sharing a selection of works that are part of the exhibition or works that I discuss in my catalog essay. 
Since it's almost Halloween, I hope it won't terrify the IFP Day audience too much that some of my slides may contain drawings. <laughs> Throughout the Enlightenment, geographical thinking infiltrated everything from the renovations of the gardens of Versailles, landscape compositions, and parlor games. The popularity of the discipline is parodied in this drawing by saint Aubin of an elite dinner party. Note how the host, sometimes thought to be Voltaire, uses a compass and a scalpel to carve up a roast bird served in the armature of a globe. The efficacy of this image is underscored later in James Gilray's satirical cartoon, The Plum Pudding in Danger, which depicts the British Prime Minister William Pitt and Napoleon Bonaparte cutting up a globe-shaped plum pudding as an allegory of their imperial agendas. In both instances, the insatiable appetite for cartographic, scientific, and geographic knowledge leads the diners to consume geography itself. Also evident in these images is the importance of the mapped world. For example, one of the co-editors of the Encyclopédie called their expansive publication as, quote, a kind of a world map, end quote. During the 18th century, geographical fascination extended from the terrestrial to the celestial. Consider this print by George Smith of a solar eclipse of 1748, which was published alongside a short pamphlet. This map seems rather ahead of its time. The central map charts the path of the eclipse, while the little cells bordering the map shows how the solar eclipse would have been seen in various cities uniting far-flung geographies through their view of the sky. The cities listed include London, Paris, and Rome, but also Cairo, Jerusalem, Goa, Boston, and Quebec. A list that unveils the rising shadow of empire in any discussion of geography and maps in this period. Sticking with Quebec for a moment, Interest in geographies extend toward prints that disseminated imagined visions of inhabitants of new colonial territories. For example, consider this print by Angouf after a painting exhibited by Jean-Jacques Lubabier in the Salon of 1781. The composition takes a subject matter from an anecdote from Abbé de Reynal's History of the Two Indies, in which he recounts a supposed mourning custom by indigenous Canadians which involves some mother showering her child's tomb with her breast milk. And you can really see the breast milk here, streaming from the curiously fair-skinned woman in the guise of nursing Madonna. This fountain of breast milk is not present in the painting and is wholly an invention of the printmaker. Such works are complicit in French conception of indigeneity and illuminate how geographic distance was part and parcel of French negotiation of racial and cultural difference at the very moment that the French Atlantic Empire was being redrawn. And Crystal, who you heard from earlier, has located this engraving as one of the best-selling prints of the era, all selling before letters. Another fascinating example of imagined geography is this publication by George Salmanzar, a Frenchman who staged an elaborate hoax in early 18th century London, and I reiterate the Frenchman, by pretending to be a resident of present-day Taiwan, i.e. pretending to be an East Asian man, and even publishing this entirely fictitious account that was replete with proto-Orientalist fantasies, including, to the left, his vision of Taiwanese religious idols. One of the central tools of geography is cartography, the science of map making. This red chalk drawing from the Horvitz collection underscores the importance of systems that enabled cartography, such as the cartographic scale. But it is important to think not only about what such maps depict, but the networks of production itself. In the 18th century, Paris and London supplanted Amsterdam as capitals of the European map trade. Moreover, just as the historiography of the Enlightenment has been Franco-centric, a statistical analysis of geographic textbooks that were available to the general public, and by extensions, engravings within these books, were statistically centered on France. 
The presumed geographic importance of France to the Enlightenment studies as a whole is thus inseparable from the objects and institutions that enable the study of geography. Certainly in Paris, new institutions were set up to teach cartography, such as the École Royale de Pont et Chaussée, pictured here. Not pictured on this slide, mostly because I couldn't figure out how to convey its enormity, and stay with me, is the Cassini family Carte de France. This is the most celebra celebrated cartographical endeavors which was the first complete survey of a nation using triangulation, took 65 years to complete, and was printed on 182 sheets. Beyond the state and the institutional level, geography permeated the domestic sphere. To the left is a frontispiece for a French educational text for children, starting them young as it were, and the right is a gorgeous map of Stockholm on view at Harvard, that combined the map of the city with a profile view of its urban spaces, showing that attention toward mapping went beyond the usual centers and the exotic locales to other cities that have been traditionally ignored in the European Enlightenment studies. Certainly, the growing prevalence of the Grand Tour and overseas exploration prompted a geographic interest within the upper classes. Let's finally turn to geographical parlor games. Consider these puzzle maps by John Spilsbury, who is often credited as the inventor of jigsaw puzzles. Initially called dissected maps, these early puzzles were essentially engravings of maps pasted onto thin slivers of mahogany and cut along national borders. Spilsbury's maps of European countries, continent, and even ancient geographies proved immensely popular and helped animate a subject previously learned through memorization. Indeed, there are several references in French and British literature, including in Jane Austen, in which ability to complete geographic games was considered as a way of establishing one's social class. And the slide to the left shows the, um, the pieces all put together. Turning our gaze to geography also broadens the horizon of print culture in this period and the different ways in which prints were activated and embodied. I will conclude with a seemingly innocuous final example, a geographical game by Thomas Jeffries. He's attributed with inventing the first board game that had a map for a playing surface, a revision of the popular game of the goose, but with nationalistic undertones. And if you like board games, Jeffries' game is considered the precursor to the popular board game Risk. These geographic games were essentially instruments of authority on smaller and domestic scales, enabling individual ownership over national borders. Such drawings and prints helped disseminate and consolidate knowledge that were complicit in shaping national identities and facilitating ex explorations at the expense of indigenous and enslaved peoples. Parsing the graphic component of geographic production enables us to reconsider the discipline's assumed objectivity and it inevitably uncloaks the Eurocentricism inherent in the geography of the very study of the Enlightenment. Although the once commanding prominence of geography as an academic discipline seems to have waned today, for example, you can no longer major in geography at Harvard for the last 50 years or so, the field has covertly remained an apparatus of power Gerrymandering policies in the United States are as just as much a product of Enlightenment geographic thinking as the newly released high-res photos of the universe from the James Webb Space Telescope. From the 18th century to the present, printmakers have depicted ordered views of regions and territories for all kinds of purposes, beyond aesthetic consideration. Because in the end, no part of the world or the universe can be consumed until it has first been given visual form. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I think you got a sense of the kind of fun that Crystal and I have, have had learning from these just supremely talented contributors. And they're just two of, of many um, wonderful scholars who, who have um, helped to, to bring our work to, to all of our work to light. Are there any questions from the audience?
Do you have one, Crystal? You look like you have a question. <laughs> I, <laughs> I actually have a question. If you okay. okay. So one of the things that Crystal and I have been saying on our tours is that there was no learning curve for us on this project. It was just straight up. <laughs> you know, the amount that we both learned, and that's, I mean, that's saying, that's saying a lot for Crystal, who, of course, is teaching this um, every semester. But certainly for me, that's absolutely typifies my experience on this project. But I wanted to know from, from you, Thea and Cabell, um, do you see the 18th century differently now that you work, have worked on this project? And of course, I've been working on your dissertations and so forth. Like, has there been any sort of light bulb moments of, wow, OK, really hadn't thought about this period quite in this, in this way? Like, this changes the, changes the game for me, so to speak. I can go first. I think, honestly, it has emboldened me, as it were, to um, ask the type of questions that I didn't know we were capable of asking or allowed to approach. And um, it's also helped me think about the Enlightenment the, as a movement, as a discipline itself, with, um, with more critical eyes. Yeah. Um, so I would go back to when you were redoing the show. And I was interning for you. And I basically, rather than looking for specific objects, which we knew, tried to figure out how to find every 18th century object held in the Harvard libraries, <laughs> which turned out to be a lot, um, as you might expect. But it was also all of the unexpected that I then found and then we then talked about through that lens. And I think part of the the takeaway if I've seen from this project is it's so important to figure out how to look for things you don't even know how to describe at first. Yeah, that's so great. That's right. That's one of the semesters we discovered the money devil. Well, we didn't. We went over to Baker Library and they told us about that recent acquisition. <laughs> I mean, that was one of the, I mean, there were many surprises, but one of the, one of them was precisely how much is held in Harvard, in Harvard libraries that we might normally never or I would never <laughs> normally enter. So very specific science libraries turned out to have some really amazing material and certainly to me, very unfamiliar material. And then we were lucky enough to have uh, be able to include that material in the show. So if I'm not mistaken, Elizabeth, right, half, half of the loans are, half of the objects on view are from the Harvard collections. Complemented by many other very exciting loans. <laughs> You, sh you mainly talked about and showed prints and drawings. Um, are there like what one consider like, you know, traditional paintings in the show or artworks? Or are they all this more supportive material to like high art, if one could say that? So we have some 3D objects to animate the space, but our requirement was that they had to involve paper in some way. So we have a portable orrery, which has a printed face and um, a mariner's compass, which also has a printed it's a dry card compass, so it's a printed, printed face. Um, we really, as at one point, we were planning to have some um, paintings and sculptures sort of dotted throughout, and perhaps as a foil in some sense to some of the arguments. And then the more we worked, the more we discovered that our that our in our arguments honed that we really want to drill down on on works on paper, these mobile objects that were quicker to produce, that could respond um, and comment on events as they were unfolding much quicker than painting and sculpture could, but that also could be disseminated, that could be consumed in vastly different um, places um, around, across Europe and in the Atlantic world. I mean, you could also add that there are a lot of books in the show. Um, so in addition to, you know, works on paper on the walls, there's a lot of books and our exhibit designer did an amazing job with the casework. So should you visit, <laughs> you, you will see. I have a question um, for, for Elizabeth and Crystal. Is there a work that got away, as it were? <laughs> One you dream about, that, about having in the exhibition? I'll, well, I'll answer for myself. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, we, there were a few Roland requests that we made where we knew we were aiming high and weren't surprised when, uh, this didn't happen very often. We were very lucky. Um, but no, I don't. I don't think so. I think we, I, I, at least again from my perspective, I think we 
we were able to get pretty much everything. I mean, I think the one challenge was that some very exciting imagery is in books, and there's a finite number of books that can be included in uh, um, this kind of show. Um, but I, no, I don't, I don't think so. Maybe Elizabeth. I think, I forget if you and I were talking about this, Cabell, but we had at one point wanted to include a bunch, uh, more optical devices and to really get at the theories of perception and ways of looking, um, which really transformed during this period. And um, that had, we, I remember when we worked together on this, we had a whole loan list prepared from a very particular collection that then ended up being not accessible or not, they not the objects weren't lendable. Um, and that sort of dropped off, and I kind of I kind of miss that, you know, as I've been talking about the show and doing tours. But there were some when you said got away. I mean, there were some objects that, given what, um, given the pandemic and the realities of the pandemic, we weren't able to travel and do the kind of research required. So there were there were there's one print in particular. I know you know which one I mean because I was talking about it so so much. But without being able to travel to, to to Parma and other places, I wasn't able to do the kind of primary research that was required. And I had to drop that from my essay, even though that print would have been really good in in my argument. But I couldn't I couldn't crack it, so to speak, given the you know the logistical challenges of the pandemic. Hi, I, I just wanted to really congratulate you on a wonderful exhibition that I hope a lot of us will be able to see in all your research. But can you give us a sense of how many women were involved in this um, pursuit of knowledge in all the various topics, please? Uh, more than are represented in prints and drawings. I mean, this this was one of the many revelations to me was the ways in which the proliferation of images of scientific demonstration, scientific experiment, um, elides the presence of women at the, and the active uh, engagement of women in those practices. So it's an interesting um, effect of this, these cumulative images of 18th century science that, that really don't depict the women that were involved. So I can't give you an exact number, but it became very clear looking over these images and correlating the images with what we know of women's participation in um, 18th century science, but 18th century philosophical debate that there they're are far fewer representations of them. We work keen to try to represent as many women artists as we could in the show um, in meaningful ways. And one of our other contributors who's, who's not here, Sarah Lund, she's also a, a PhD candidate at Harvard who's writing a dissertation on women artists in France from, is it 1790 to 1820? Right around that, that time period. And she worked with us um, thinking through those lists and um, trying to do, um, to, to represent those, those artists as well as, as we could. Um, but Crystal's right, we wanted to there's a lot of there's a lot of historical aspects right of the period that simply aren't in the visual record right which is really fascinating in itself and comes out in the catalog a lot but to represent that or just to show that say that in an exhibition there's a challenge right so you do in your labels and you hope people read them I wonder to what extent you included botanical illustrations in your show, which would, of course, include Maria Sibylla Marion, a prominent woman, but and her and her family. So we have a what I call the, the nature case. We have a, a case devoted to the, the, uh, the all the objects in the case relate really, to uh, the study of the natural world, and there, we have two, work by two women at the center of that case. So um, a print by Mary Lawrence and then um, a beautiful, beautiful drawing of gooseberries from the National Gallery of Art by Barbara Deitch. Hi, thank you all. Ooh, that's loud. Um, just, I kind of wanted to ask the opposite of Cabell's question, actually, which is, what have been the revelations since the show's been up for you, going through the show with different visitors? <laughs> Very into the post-mortem question. Well, we expected people to be horrified by the Gautier de Gautier, and they are, but they really want to talk about it too, um, which is, which is really, it's been really interesting. I give this, I give, you know, sort of an hour long tour, you know, for the public, and I've been doing a lot of them um, on the weekends when they're, we have the most crowds at in the university museum. Um, and 
the, the times I, I've sort of done like a test, like I don't mention it, and every single time I don't, somebody asks me, wait, before we go, can you tell us about, you know, this, this crazy print that's, you know, on all banners outside and we see on the buses and so forth. Um, so that's been interesting, because I, there, we had been told by some people early on in the project that people would be so horrified they wouldn't want to look at it or think about it or see it. And so it's sort of it's been the opposite of that. People are horrified but want to talk about what, what it is that's disturbing. Hi, I'm just curious to know, um, you have so many collaborators to your catalog, uh, how many people, how diverse was uh, your collaborators across the university? Are you working with other specialists in the other departments or was it uh, uh, mostly the art history department? So it's very diverse. So there are, as you um, see, um, graduate students um, from Harvard but also from MIT who contributed to the catalog, um, art historians, um, colleagues at the Harvard Art Museums, but also um, we have a very prominent historian, Paul Friedland, who wrote the essay on cruelty. Um, I'm, I'm, who am I missing? I'm missing some. The art conservation, yes. the paper conservation team. Which yes, <laughs> thank you. Did a wonderful, wonderful job. We, we had at one point wanted to have um, a more interdisciplinary approach in terms of the authorship, and the the, um, the partnerships didn't emerge from the research, um, and we really want, wanted to go with what felt organic and 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 um, and was a comfortable comfortable fit. But um, yeah, it was it was a bit of a circus pulling off that book. I will say, <laughs> well, I think we're we're out of time. But thank you all so much. I hope you'll come see the show and talk more with us about it.